Welcome to Lecture 18. In this lecture, we will qualitatively interpret NMR spectra. This lecture will be divided into two parts. In the first part, we will examine how we describe the nuclei using quantum mechanical terms. And in the second part, we will apply these properties to predict NMR spectra of simple molecules. Like electrons, nuclei have intrinsic spin. A poor representation of this intrinsic spin is to imagine that the nuclei are spinning about an internal axis, like a top, as illustrated in the figure on the right. The magnitude of this spin depends on the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. For example, if the number of protons is even and the number of neutrons is even, then the total amount of intrinsic spin the nucleus has is zero. If the number of protons is odd and the number of neutrons is odd, then the total amount of intrinsic spin the nucleus has will be a positive integer. If the number of protons is even and the number of neutrons is odd, then the total amount of intrinsic spin the nucleus has will be a positive half integer. And finally, if the number of protons is odd and the number of neutrons is even, then the total amount of intrinsic spin the nucleus has will also be a positive half integer. Nuclei are spinning charges and spinning charges have magnetic moments. For a hydrogen nucleus, which is composed of a single proton, that magnetic moment, being called mu sub n, is equal to the elementary charge E times h bar divided by 2 times the mass of the proton, which is equal to 5.051 times 10 to the minus 27 joules per tesla. Recall the Zeeman effect. Just like electrons, nuclei in a magnetic field split the 2L plus 1 degenerate states into discrete energy levels. For nuclei, the deviation in energy from the case when the magnetic field is turned off is equal to negative gamma sub n times h bar times the magnetic field B naught times m sub L, where gamma is called the gyromagnetic ratio and is the ratio of the magnetic moment to its angular momentum. Take note that almost all the values that determine this energy splitting are constants, which are related to the type of nucleus. The only variable that we can directly change is the strength of the magnetic field. So by increasing the magnetic field, we can increase the size of the energy split. The hydrogen nucleus has one proton and no neutrons, so it is a half integer spin nucleus. It so happens that it's a spin one half nucleus. And so since there are 2L plus 1 degenerate states when objects with magnetic moments are placed in magnetic fields, then the hydrogen nucleus will exhibit two distinct energy states. The negative 1 half spin state being aligned against the magnetic field will be higher in energy than the positive 1 half spin state which is aligned with the magnetic field. This change in energy can be alternatively expressed as negative g times the magnetic moment times the magnitude of the magnetic field times the spin where g is called the g factor, and it's equal to gamma sub n times h bar divided by the magnetic moment. The g factor is an experimentally determined dimensionless quantity with values typically between minus 6 and 6. It characterizes the magnetic moment and gyromagnetic ratio of a nucleus. It's equal to the gyromagnetic ratio times h bar divided by the magnetic moment of the nucleus. So the g-factor is closely related to the gyromagnetic ratio, and both are typically used to quantify the change in energy of a spinning nucleus in a magnetic field. Looking at a table of spin properties, we can see that hydrogen nuclei and fluorine-19 nuclei have especially high gyromagnetic ratios. This means that the energy splitting is the greatest between spin-up and spin-down for these nuclei. For other nuclei, like carbon-13 and phosphorus-31, the gyromagnetic ratio is a little lower, meaning that compared to hydrogen and fluorine-19, the energy difference due to the introduction of a given magnetic field will be lower. Now, if the magnetic moment of the nuclei is not aligned with the magnetic field, the nucleus processes, meaning that it spins around the direction of the applied magnetic field. The frequency of the precession for spin one-half particles is given by the total energy difference between the two states. So delta E is equal to negative gamma times h bar times the applied magnetic field times negative one-half minus one-half. That adds to minus one, which cancels out the negative sign at the front. 
On the left-hand side, delta E is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency. So solving for the precession frequency gives the gyromagnetic ratio times the magnetic field divided by 2 pi. Again, note that the frequency, which is dependent upon the energy gap between the two states, is determined by constants that are defined by the nuclei, as well as the strength of the magnetic field. As the magnetic field increases, so does the Larmor precession frequency. Fourier transform NMR is a powerful technique which can measure multiple Larmor precession frequencies simultaneously. This is useful because as molecules become more complex, there will be many Larmor precession frequencies to measure to get a complete spectra. In practice, what happens is a sample is placed in a strong magnetic field and is then exposed to brief bursts of radio frequency radiation which change the orientation of the nuclear spins in a controlled way. The radiation that is emitted by the sample as it returns to equilibrium is monitored and analyzed by applying a Fourier transform to extract all frequencies simultaneously. Here is that procedure illustrated in pictures. In A, the initial state, the sample has all the magnetic moments, denoted as M, pointing along the direction of the magnetic field. In image B, a radio frequency pulse in this case, called a pi one-half pulse, rotates all the spins 90 degrees. In image C, the result of that rotation can be seen. Since the original magnetic field is still on, all the spins experience a torque which will rotate them to point back along the direction of the main field pointing in the z-direction. This is what's illustrated in image D. However, since all the nuclei may have different Larmor precession frequencies, then they will all precess at different rates around that main magnetic field. The signal that is emitted due to these different Larmor precession frequencies, which can only be measured when the spins are out of alignment with the magnetic field pointed in the z-direction, is what gives an NMR spectra. The image on the top is an example signal from a pi over 2 pulse NMR experiment. It is a decaying wave that eventually goes to zero. This is because the spins move from being perpendicular to the magnetic field to pointing along the magnetic field, so the magnitude of the signal from the processing nuclei decays. This waveform is composed of signals from all the nuclei with different Larmor frequencies, and they are all measured at the same time. Fourier transforms take signals in the time domain and change them to the frequency domain. So what this means is that all the frequencies in that wave can be resolved into individual peaks whose frequency can be determined by looking along the frequency axis. This way, all the information can come in at the same time and all the different Larmor precession frequencies can be determined.